Okay, welcome back everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this afternoon's last session is a little bit different than the others today. It's a conversation, an interview with Dr. Lawrence Powell of Tulane University and Dr. Walter Johnson of Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Johnson is the Winthrop Professor of History, Professor of African and African American Studies, and Director of the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard University. His books, Soul by Soul, Life Inside the Antebellum Slave Market, and River of Dark Dreams, Slavery and Empire in the Cotton Kingdom, have received numerous awards. He is currently writing a book about the central role of St. Louis in the imperialist and racial capitalist history of the United States, from Lewis and Clark to Michael Brown. Johnson is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, fellowships from the American Philosophical Society, the Ratcliffe Institute, and the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and a Mellon Fellowship in Cultural Studies at Wesleyan University. After a youth spent bouncing from west to east and from Europe to Asia, Larry Powell happily found a permanent home in New Orleans when he accepted a position at Tulane University in 1978. Now Professor Emeritus of History at Tulane, Dr. Powell has published extensively on subjects ranging from the American Civil War and Reconstruction to the Holocaust. But most people now know him by his award-winning book, The Accidental City, Improvising New Orleans. Please welcome Dr. Walter Johnson and Dr. Larry Powell. Thanks very much, Daniel. I, I always have to explain to a, a mixed audience what it means to be a, uh, an emeritus professor. It means basically that you get free parking at Tulane if you can find it. Uh, my job is going to be, uh, as I quipped to, to uh, Walter last night, uh, I'm just going to be an intellectual escort up here. Uh, and I want to begin with his seminal book, and it is seminal. A soul by soul, I think it really broke the the uh, uh, the framework in which we think about uh, slavery. And I want to begin with an arresting uh, introductory uh, partial paragraph. I think about at page two or three, and he begins uh, talking about the New Orleans uh, slave trade in terms of showrooms, as though a furniture storeroom, a showroom, for example. And it's eloquent uh, beyond description. And he writes, he says, it is a story of back and forth glances and estimations, of hushed conspiracies and loud boasts, of power, fear, and desire, of mistrust and dissimulation, of human beings being broken down into parts and recomposed as commodities, of futures promised, purchased and resisted, it is in no small measure the story of antebellum slavery. In other words, Walter is less interested in slavery as a numbers game, although that figures part prominently in his story. Uh, he's more interested in the cognitive transaction between unequal parties, between the purchased and the purchase purchasers, uh, unequal parties to which, in which, to which everyone will agree was an, an uh, infernal commerce. But I think for starters, before we get into the, the deep insights in Soul by Soul, and also in his most recent book, Rivers of Dark Dreams, we ought to set the numerical stage, what makes New Orleans uh, distinctive, and it was very distinctive. Uh, what distinguishes the Atlantic slave trade from what we call the domestic or the interstate slave trade? And what was New Orleans' central role in it? And I thought, uh, Walter, I'm going to turn this over to you, but I, what, I think the latest estimate of the number of, of enslaved Africans transported across the Atlantic Ocean was around 10 or 11 million. Is that about the right estimate? And of that number, Somewhere in the, uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of about 400,000 came to the United States. And I think that gives you some uh, uh, arresting uh, uh, backdrop to think about the domestic slave trade. Thank you. So the first thing I need to say is I want to remember 
two people who helped me with this work when I started out in New Orleans a long time ago, and that is um, Marie Wendell at UNO and Judith Schaefer at Tulane, and those are my, that's my, that's my squad. And so, um, and they were unbelievably generous to me, and so it seems incumbent upon me to, to publicly thank and remember them. Um, what Larry just referred to is, I think, to some people surprising um, that there were somewhere around a half million, uh, yeah, a half million enslaved Africans imported to North America in total out of the 11 or 12 million who were sold across the transatlantic, across the Atlantic. And the, the story there, of course, is the story of sugar. I mean, sugar is in the title of one famous book, Sugar is Made with Blood, the average life expectancy of an enslaved person who arrived in a place like Brazil or Cuba was seven years from the time that they stepped on the coast. And that's not the case in North America, and it's not the case um, not because North American slaveholders were particularly benevolent, um, but it has to do with the climate and the crop regime. And so um, North America and then the United States is the only place in the New World where there's a self-reproducing slave population um, from the 18th century on. So by the time of the Civil War, there are four million enslaved people in Brazil and four million enslaved people in the United States, but, but those two societies have very, very different relationships to the Atlantic slave trade and to Africa. Um, what that meant, in a, in a way, is that when the slave trade to the United States was closed in 1808, when the Atlantic slave trade to the United States was closed, the, um, the, the transformation of slavery in the 19th century that comes with the opening of the Southwest to white settlement, what is then the Southwest, by which I mean Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, the old Southwest, um, to white settlement and the, the, what's, what could be called the second slavery, the reinvigoration of American slavery, involves a, um, a, a huge forced migration of enslaved people in the United States. And between 1820 and 1860, as many as a million people were moved from places like Maryland and Virginia to Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Um, they were part of one of the largest forced migrations in human history. And two-thirds of that group of people were sold through an increasingly organized and professionalized slave trade, the interstate slave trade. The other, the, the piece I think that, that I want to, to make sure to add to that before we move on is that I, this relates, I think, to the panels this morning about the Native American history of Louisiana because this is actually not simply a history of, uh, of black people and white people and of the institution of slavery in the North and the South. This is a history of Native American removal, right? Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana are the homelands of the Choctaw and the Chickasaw and the Creek and the Seminole and the Cherokee. And so the process of the transformation of slavery and the um, cultivation of cotton are directly related to um, Indian removal in the United States and the history of U.S. imperialism. Uh, Walter, can you talk a little bit about the urban geography of slavery? I, I think uh, it might, become, might be a, a come as a surprise, but in places like Richmond, for example, uh, the slave trade was tucked away in a back alley. Uh, they wanted to keep it out of sight, but here it was hidden in plain sight. And, uh, and I don't think anyone has written about that more graphically uh, than you have, and I thought you might want to just sort of set the stage. Yeah, so if you were a traveler in the 19th century and you were, you know, if like you were a tourist in the 19th century and you were going to go visit New Orleans, one of the things that people did, white tourists did when they went to visit New Orleans is they went to look at the slave market. And there was not a single slave market. This is, there, there were a number of smaller competing slave markets. And there were at any given time probably a couple of dozen um, slave pens which is what they were called, with showrooms attached, um, active in the city. I think there have, you know, that, that um, in connection with the Purchase Lives folks, uh, with the Purchase Lives Conference, I think um, folks at Historic New Orleans Collection identified 52 different sites uh, 
in New Orleans where there were, were slave markets. Each one of those slave markets might have um, two or three or five different sort of different slave traders doing their business there. And these are not um, there's no there's no cordon of shame around these businesses. People are lined up on the street in front for sale. Um, they're dressed uh, often in um, full blue suits for men and in in calico dresses and head coverings for women. So that's that's something that's an aspect of it that we can talk about. And those um, those businesses were centered in in what's today the central business district, and then just downriver from the quarter, um, just across Esplanade. So that's. Um, you know, the, 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 which buildings were involved varied over time, but there's a, um, I think there's an 1854 census of merchants in New Orleans that you can go, I think this is actually at the historic New Orleans collection, and you can go and look and, 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 and in effect you can imagine walking along these streets in the 19th century and you'll see that, you know, there's a cotton press, coffee house, cockpit, there's a lot of cock fighting, um, slave, slave pen, cock cotton trader, custom house, slave pen. It's just, you know, it, it, it is a um, acknowledged normal daily part of the fabric of the economy in the 19th century. And indeed, I would argue it's, it's in some way, it's much more than that because it is the foundation of the city's economy in the 19th century. But I got a sense from your book, it's even more widespread that everybody almost everybody, especially white, um, had an economic stake in it, just as Des David Fleming pointed out this, this uh, <clears throat> previous session, that almost everyone in Liverpool had an interest in, in slavery. But I, you know, I, there's these, these vivid pictures of the barkeeps and, and uh, pool hall, hall operators, dance hall operators, uh, proprietors of cat houses. They're all brokering a slave deal. You know, they're, they're, everybody had a hustle and they're trying to hustle the enslaved bodies of African descended people. I mean, is that? That is a terrific observation from someone who has read my book more recently than I have. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that I think that's absolutely right, and I, I think that it is um, reminiscent of what what David Fleming just just said. And so one of the things, one of the sources that I used when I wrote the book um, were the records of the Louisiana Supreme Court, which are housed at, at UNO again, and um, those are records of disputed slave sales. And so there's a detailed commercial law of slavery in every southern state, and, and, and Louisiana is no different from that. And that law governs um, warranty, implied warranty. So, so th these are property transactions. And so there are buyers who are disappointed with the person that they bought. And they said that that person was sick at the time that, that they were purchased, or they had a bad character. They were known to be malign in some way. And so in that, that instance, they, they sue the person who sold the other person. And the Louisiana Supreme Court decided something like 200 of these cases between 1820 and 1860. And many of those cases contain a lot of testimony. And one of the things that comes up in that testimony then is that somebody will um, try to broker a transaction on a steamboat or in a coffee house, or they'll, they'll, they'll be in a saloon and they'll say, oh, well, I know somebody who can help you with that. Or that, you know, so, so there's, a, you have to imagine an information economy Economy that is not um, focused on cable news. It's an information economy that it's, it's a word of mouth economy. It's also an economy of white male sociability, right? And so the, these are men who either live in town or in town, and one of the ways that they, um, I mean, you know how men are in bars, right? One of the ways that they try to impress upon one another and anybody else who might be watching how important they are is by sort of demonstrating their expertise about this situation. And so there's a lot of information transfer. There are also a lot of people who are sort of freelance 
um, vigilante slave catchers, people who, who spend their time on the levee looking for business, um, sort of promising to, to track down runaway slaves for, for whatever bounty will be paid. And so I think it is a, a, there's a large informal sector of the economy alongside the formal sector of the economy. Also, I mean, if, if you really want to follow through the, the aspects of the economic life of the slave market, there are doctors who work in the slave market. Right? There are people who provision the slave markets. There are people who make the clothes that the enslaved people wear in the market. And there are, um, most prominently, there there are um, urban, um, what are called more, more or less factors. And so these are people who do the business of um, planters who can't always be in New Orleans. They're sort of a combination of a private banker and a personal shopper. And so that's a huge sector of the mercantile economy in New Orleans. And those people are also involved in the slave business, as well as the state of Louisiana. Right, so all all the southern states sell enslaved people all the time because enslaved people are the most liquid form of capital in the economy. So when an estate needs to be divided, or when a debt needs to be paid, then the the first thing to happen is that enslaved people are auctioned by the state. So the state also has a big um, a big piece of this. Speaking of uh slaves as capital. Another thing that, uh, that still sticks uh, memorably in my mind is your observation that the site of a lot of these slave pens are now where uh, banks in, in Central Business District are located. And uh, which it gets, again underscores the centrality of, of, uh, of, of uh, collateralized slaves in the entire economy and the financing of this, uh, this economy. Did you wanna? Yeah, I mean, so there's a symbolic aspect to that, um, which is that banks are built on top of slave markets. Um, there is a practical historical aspect to that, which is the question of, well, what sort of real estate was available in the years immediately after the Civil War for economic redevelopment in cities like New Orleans? And then I think there's a, um, there's a deeper history of, of slavery that goes along with that. So the, the Atlantic economy that David Fleming was, was just discussing, the cotton economy is a credit economy. And what that means is that every year, like, like most agricultural societies in the history of the world, it runs on advances. Cotton buyers in Liverpool advance money to merchants in New Orleans who advance money to planters in Louisiana. So planters then use that money to buy all of the supplies that they're going to use for the year, including human beings. And then when the, cop, when the crop comes in, they pay off their debts, right? So, so in the first instance, the cotton crop collateralizes the loan, right? But cotton's a very, very speculative market, and it's an agricultural product, so it's not certain how big that crop is going to be, and it's not certain of what quality any given planter's cotton will be. So there has to be another form of collateral, right? And, and what I am talking about is the collateral for the largest sector of the global economy, the cotton market, right? 85% of the cotton produced in the United States of America goes to Liverpool, Around 80% of the cotton before 1860 that is produced in Liverpool comes from the United States of America. All that is collateralized by enslaved people, right? So then there's a huge debate, right, about, well, was, was slavery capitalist or was slavery not capitalist? I mean, there's, there's people, people are making entire careers off of this debate, right? Enslaved people are the capital. There's no economy in the Atlantic in the 19th century without enslaved people, and they are the actual capital, right? So that's, that's the dimension of, um, that, you know, of, of, of enslaved people's capital value. Now, the other, you know, there's another way to think about that, which is just if you compare the value of enslaved people in 1860, which is around, um, $3 billion to other sectors of the United States economy. It's, it's a larger sector of the economy than all of the money invested in railroads at the, in 1860. 
and then all of the money invested in the entire manufacturing sector in the United States in 1860. And then you can take railroads and the entire manufacturing sector and add them together. And it's still more than that, right? So this is, this is the largest sector of the United States economy in the 19th century. And you know, what that then leads you to is the enormous human suffering on which that economy rests. Let's turn to the actual transaction, um, because that's, uh, in, <clears throat> in one respect, maybe the most arresting thing uh, in your book, uh, a book full of arresting insights. Uh, you talk about black bodies being oiled, groomed, groped, fondled, bargained over, bartered for. I mean, it's a pretty unseemly picture. But what I found interesting is, uh, I please think I'm quoting you, if not I'm paraphrasing you, that it was at this point where the Chattel principle was at its most naked, where the irreducible humanity of the slaves showed forth because there was this kind of almost kabuki theater of, of performance in New Orleans, as anybody's lived here long enough, is a city of performance addicts, especially uh, around car carnival time. And you know, here you have planners trying to purchase imagined identities, uh, slave traders who, besides being sharp businessmen, are also fairly uh, keen readers of human psychology, especially of uh, the folks they're about to, uh, to try to sell. And they've got to package stories about these, these human biographies and connect them with the dreams and aspirations of, of the people they're hoping to sell this property to. And then you have the purchased manipulating the purchasers because they themselves are trying to read this situation. And then, you know, they find, find the right owner if they're trying to make the best of a bad bargain, if you will. And this was kind of a remarkable reading, I think, of, of a, a, uh, a commerce that could be so too easily just sort of brushed aside as one of, of pure brutality. I mean, it is obviously pretty pure brutality, but. Uh, you saw, I think, a, a, a dimension of it that, until you've written about it, nobody has even caught a glimpse of. Yeah, you know, well, I, I think you caught it well with the um, the fact that that, in a way, the notion of a person with a price is a notion of um, the power of market, the power of a market, the power of capitalism as uncontested, as able to commodify anything, as able to put a price on a child. And yet at that moment, at that moment of extremity, if one looks at the court records and one looks at the slave narratives, what, what you find is um, conversations. And so you might think of these as conversations that are sort of had on the edge of the world. Um, because they're conversations that occur between people who've been torn away from their lives in Maryland or Virginia, and they've been torn away from their families and their communities and whatever sorts of social identities they have. Um, and by that I mean that we all, we all exist, we all, we all make our lives meaningful, not simply in our own heads, in the middle of the night when we're alone, but out of social connections. And so these are people who've been removed from their webs of, of social connections. And so they're struggling to make connections with one another in the slave trade, simply to, to get through the day. And then they, they're, they're put up for sale, and they're put up for sale wearing full blue suits like, like, like bankers, right? Or um, calico dresses and, and, and head coverings like domestic servants. And you look at those images, and, and it took me a while, actually. I mean, it, if, if I were a, a better person, I would have this image here for you all to see. But you, you can see it, you know, it, any, in any number of places in New Orleans, there's an image of enslaved people turned out on the street for sale. Um, with with a you know there's a kind of a portly white man um, inspecting them. So I'm, I'm not telling you I am I am 
actually aggressively not using this as a chance to tell you to buy my book, but it's in, so, so by, I, I, I feel ashamed to be referring to this at this moment, to be perfectly honest with you. But the picture is in my book, and, and so if you don't understand it, it's back there, and you can go and, and look at it. So at first I saw that image, I thought, well, th this is fanciful. This is, you know, I mean, nobody is going to dress up and slay people in full blue suits to send them to sale, because nobody who's coming to buy them is actually going to believe that enslaved people wear full blue suits to work, right? But then I looked in slave traders' account books, and you can actually see in the, in the, in the account book of a particular trader from central Missouri to New Orleans, a guy called John White, you can actually look in his day book and see where he has bought not only um, full blue suits, but he's actually bought, it says rings for the girls. He's actually bought jewelry for the enslaved women who are going to say, and you think, well, what is that about, right? And in some sense, I think the argument that I make is that it's, it's about a kind of an aggressive standardization in the sense that you have people who come from all different kinds of places and have all different kinds of stories and all different kinds of skills. But what the slave traders do is they try to standardize them so that they then are the people who control the information about enslaved people's pasts. And they tell the enslaved people what to say, right? And so what the, what the slave buyer is supposed to encounter when they go into the slave market is a situation in which they need to rely upon the slave traders for information, right? Now, slave buyers, you know, they might be people who we think are morally reprehensible, but they're not stupid. And so they walk into a situation where they see people arrayed on a street in these fancy clothes, and they think, well, this is not, this is not reality. This is some kind of hyper-reality. This is some kind of, um, I, I keep wanting to use the simulacrum, which I, I apologize for. This is, a, this is a pretend version of reality. And so they have a couple of options in that situation. And, and, and one option is to try to, to, to break through that facade. And so the way they do that is they ask enslaved people to get undressed. Right? And they'll, they'll go into the back room, and they'll look to see if somebody has scars, if they've been punished. And, and they'll then read that punishment not as a diagnostic of the fact that this person had a psychotic master in Virginia. They'll read that as a statement about the person who bears the scars rather than the one who inflicted them. And they'll try to, you know, it's, it's actually very, it, it, it's very intimate in not, it, not ways that are explicitly sexual, but they'll take people's hands in their own and work their hands back and forth to figure out if they have the so-called dexterity to, to pick cotton. And they'll, they'll look at women's breasts and they'll try to figure out if they'll, they have born children. And it, it just goes on and on and on. And this is, and again, it, this is not done on the street, but nor is it done in secret. Everybody knows that this is happening. Right? And so there's a moment then, which is a moment of extreme exposure. But it is also, and, and this is where I, I, I want you to, to just stop and pause, but it, it is also a moment of human proximity and also of opportunity for enslaved people. So there's a man called L.M. Mills, and he writes, he, he, he says, He says, in this, I, I'm not going to be able to quote him directly, but he says, you know, in the slave market, enslaved people were forced to tell the stories that slave traders told them to tell. And they were expected by the buyers to give honest answers to any questions. And he says, many times they were beaten by the buyers for having lied, right? And many times they were beaten by the traders for having told the truth. So he says, it was pretty sure a thrashing either way. So he's describing a situation of extraordinary vulnerability, right? He's also describing a situation in which the business being done between slave traders and slave buyers is necessarily being done through enslaved people, right? So you listen to L.M. Mills, and then you go read John Parker's narrative, which has been 
published fairly recently as His Promised Land. And John Parker says, I made up my mind to choose my own master. He says, when anyone came who I did not like, I made myself disagreeable and answered all questions with a no. Right? Parker's goal, and this is, this is not, it's not just Parker, this runs through a lot of the narratives, was to be sold in New Orleans. Now, his goal wasn't to be sold in New Orleans because, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to puncture the mood, which is, <laughs> but it wasn't because he thought New Orleans was so fantastic in and of itself. It was because every day on the levee in New Orleans, ships left for St. Louis or for Cincinnati or for Louisville or for places that he thought he could escape, right? And so a lot of people try then to, to be in, in the city because they think that's a way for them to escape. Now you can extend a list of imperatives that human beings might have. They might, you know, they're, they're taking chances, right? And these are, these are not, um, this, this is not some kind of, of um, situation in which enslaved people are um, resisting in a way that is going to directly lead to their emancipation. These are tiny little gradients of survival. But they'll look and they'll say, well, okay, here's somebody who, who looks to me like a nicer person. Or maybe he'll sell me closer to my family. Or maybe I can stay together with this group of people, right? So then, can I, can I keep talking about this? Sure. Uh, then you see, and this, this, this was most extraordinary to me when I found it. I told you all that there was this warranty law of slavery, right? That, that warranty law, right, that's called retribution law. Those of you who live in Louisiana will be familiar with this law because this is the law and the very self-same precedents that still govern your purchase of a used car in Louisiana. So the legal precedents the legal precedence from the slave market and the commercial law that was employed in and defined by the slave market in the 19th century still is part of the Louisiana law around implied warranty. And that, that law has, you know, if you're going to say, for instance, that somebody has a vice of character, that somebody is a bad person at the time they're sold, well, you have to have a legal standard by which you're going to judge who is a bad person. And that legal standard under, under Louisiana law in the 19th century is someone who has run away once for more than a month or twice for less than a month. And if, if they meet that legal standard, then under Louisiana law, they are a habitual runaway. And if they're a habitual runaway, then the person who buys them has the right to take them back to the market and get a full refund, right? So then you go and you read Henry Bibbs' narrative, another narrative of an enslaved person who was sold in the New Orleans market. And at some point in his narrative, Bibb writes, I did not tell him that I had run away once for more than a month or twice for less than a month for these questions he did not ask me. Right? And that's just sitting in the narrative. Right? And I hadn't figured out what it meant until I learned about retribution law, but what that means is that Henry Bibb knows the commercial law of slavery. That means that Henry Bibb knows that if he is sold into a situation that he is unhappy with, he knows how to at least get back into the slave market in New Orleans where he has another chance. Right? He knows that much about the law of slavery. Now again, we don't want to overestimate this. We don't want to, you know, go home and say, oh, well, okay, everybody was, you know, she wasn't that bad because everybody had this little margin of manipulation. But still, this is a fairly amazing thing. You have enslaved people who know the commercial law of slavery and know how to manipulate it. And slave traders then, once you sort of pick up on this, you can see them in their letters worrying about individual people doing this individual people manipulating buyers who they don't like in order to try to take another, another shot at it or even another shot at escape. I think I'm going to exercise my prerogative as moderator and with the 10 minutes left, open it up to the floor, the questions from the floor. Way in the back. <laughs> 
this work? Like, was there a time of day that the auction part was open? Or was that all day long? How much food and drink was actually served compared to the time in the auction? Did everyone hear that question? Okay. Yeah, there, there's a couple things going on there. So first of all, all of the sales that I'm talking about, the things that I know the most about, are private sales. And so they're not actually auction sales. They are they're sales that are accomplished in bargaining between a slave buyer and a slave trader in a kind of a retail model. Um, slave auctions, um, by and large, in New Orleans are state-ordered auctions. And so they are estate sales, they're succession sales, or they're debt sales. And um, I think they do occur in places like the, the St. Louis Hotel under the Rotunda. Um, they, they occur on the St. Charles Hotel. And there's a very famous auctioneer, um, Joseph Beard, who had his office right down by the the cathedral. And so they do occur in public social settings. Um, to be honest with you, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head about um, the, the sort of the, the daily schedule. But I think it is um, fair to say what, what your question suggests is that there is a, um, there's a proximity, there's an intimate, promiscuous proximity between this um, mode of economy, which is to say selling human beings for profit, and other forms of consumption. Yes, right. Uh, yeah. Everybody hear that question? The question was, uh, was there an effort to reopen the slave trade as we got very closer to secession and war? African slave trade. Um, yes, there was, a re there was an effort to reopen the Atlantic slave trade. It was a, um, a pretty prominent part of politics in the Mississippi route, River Valley throughout the 1850s. So people in the Mississippi River Valley in the 1850s feel like they are on the front edge of the leading sector of the global economy. Um, and even as they are on the front edge of the leading sector of the global economy, they believe that their, um, their soil is getting exhausted and they need to move on. And so one of their ideas is that they want to import more and more people to occupy more and more land to make absolutely certain that they maintain monopoly control, or this in, in this case, monopsony control, I think, of the, or no, monopoly control of, of cotton in the global economy. So that then the British have to bend to their will because the British need the cotton in order to keep their industrial manufacturing economy going. The other piece about the um, reopening of the Atlantic slave trade is that its promoters see it as a solution to the problem of non-slaveholding whites in a slaveholding society. So we have to remember that 40% of the population in the antebellum south are non-slaveholding white people. Right? And so slaveholders, as the politics of slavery gets more and more contested through the 1850s, they recognize that they have a, they have a, they have a non-slaveholding white problem. Right? What if these people don't stay loyal to slavery? These same white people who, you know, one of the things that the three-fifths compromise means is that apportionment by county in the South is done unequally. Right? Slaveholders have greater political rights in most state polities than do non-slaveholding white people. And by 1857, it's no secret, there's a lot of non-slaveholding white people who are frustrated with There's a very famous book by a guy called Hinton Rowan Helper called The Impending Crisis, where he says slaveholders say that they represent the South, but actually they only represent themselves. They don't represent us. So reopening the slave trade is seen as a way of lowering prices in the slave market and thus removing barriers to entry for non-slaveholding white people. And they're dead be serious about it. Um, and indeed, in Louisiana in 1859, there's a proposal that comes forward that is, um, 
I can't quite remember the details, but I think it passes in the lower house and then it is only defeated in the Louisiana State Senate because those who are opposed to it keep running out of the hall so that there's no quorum until they can get their friends to come in and, and vote it down. So this is, this is a very active politics on the, on the eve of the Civil War, particularly in Louisiana, Mississippi, and for slightly different reasons in South Carolina. I think we have time for one more question, yes. The question is that there was uh, a slave holding area over in, in Algiers Point, probably, is what you mean, yeah. Uh, and how does that compare or relate to the ubiquitous slave pens uh, on, on the east bank of New Orleans? So the Atlantic slave trade to the United States, which is what is commemorated there, was closed in 1808. Now there are still um, enslaved people are being smuggled into um, into the United States after 1808, and that that's in fact that's what Jean Lafitte does, right? So Jean Lafitte is a, is a pirate, um, and what pirate means after 1808 is slave trader. And so that means illegally importing people into the United States of America. But the bulk of what I'm talking about is the interstate slave trade. So that's after the slave trade has been closed. And those markets are on the East Bank. They're here. And they're in the CBD on Barone, Gravier Street, um, and, and in the Marigny. And so those are the sites. And those are sites which um, one can figure out where they are from the, the census of merchants. Um, it's, it's painstaking work, but it's work that I think um, Aaron Greenwell did at the Historic New Orleans Collection in connection with the Purchased Lives exhibit. And so those are now sites that are not widely known, but they are knowable. And you could actually go and find where on any given block of this city there was a, a slave market um, of the type I'm talking about at any moment in time. Then in addition to that, there are, you know, the, the, the other thing that I've been talking about are these larger public auctions. And that was at the St. Louis Hotel, which is now the, um, where the Omni, I think, is. And um, at the St. Charles Hotel, which burned down. Some, I can't remember when the St. Charles Hotel burned out, but it's a little bit uptown. Um, and, and then you could also figure out where the auctioneers had their office. These, these are all things that are um, knowable. And some of it, particularly the site of these, I think, um, 50, 52 um, markets on the East Bank, th those are, are now known. I think a lot of those auction houses, we're, we're out of time, I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of those auction houses were uh, on Exchange Alley, I believe. Exactly. Uh, you know, just in closing, I think what one story here that's implied uh, or implicit, but I think needs to be, uh, we need to remind ourselves of, is this is a story of broken families. And although we're talking about the one million enslaved people who came from the upper to the lower south, what we often overlook that there were another two million who were sold locally. So this, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a kind of a moral rot that we're still trying to uh, live our way out of. But please uh, join me in thanking Walter Johnson for a wonderful <laughs>